Hello and welcome to Talking Automotive with Mark and John. My name is John Sinclair and my co-host Mark Palavestra. Hi John. Today we've got a very interesting guest. We've got Christopher Newen. Christopher has a new startup in the AI space called AI-Tomatic. Now, Christopher explains the actual state of play right now with AI and autos, and it is a real eye-opening discussion. Yeah, to me, it was really fascinating. Uh, Christopher tells us that you basically got a 100% chance that your car can be hacked, but all the prevention mechanisms are put in place to prevent that. So very interesting talk, and I think this is going to become a big part of our future. So let's jump into it. If you like what you hear today, remember to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes, and visit our website at autocurrents.com. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services is an independent division of Precar Services, offering specialty fleet fit-outs for commercial applications ranging from simple tray and tow bar fitments to fully bespoke service body and accessory installation. With quality assured safety, compliance and standardisation of vehicle builds, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. For further information on how Precar Fleet Services can assist in solving your commercial vehicle fit-out needs, please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Modera is a cloud-based AI-powered CRM and retail platform aimed at digitizing the physical process of selling a car. The Modera platform sits between existing automotive dealer and OEM systems, providing car dealerships a quick and easy shift to digital ways of working, all done entirely digitally and with total ease. Hi Christopher, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for joining us today. You're busy with a startup of an artificial intelligence company. Can you tell us about the company and what you're doing? Hi John, thanks for having me. Hi Mark. Well, well, there are, my company now is called iTomatic. That's like uh, automatic, but with AI. So I think that, that implies some kind of automation using AI. Now, uh, you keep track of it. There are lots and lots of AI companies these days operating at multiple layers and you know, trying to deliver value at, at, at various points in the ecosystem. We have a very particular opinion uh, about the technology uh, as it pertains to physical industry. So, so we don't do AI for Google. You know, Google is pretty good at it already. Uh, but when we try to do AI machine learning for the physical industry, like automotive, for example, uh, we, we find uh, an interesting problem. And I'll talk more about the problem, but essentially a solution to that turns out to be leveraging human expertise. That is domain expertise. And so we, wish, we specialize in, in a branch of AI called knowledge first AI. And that is a combination of human knowledge, with data to to generate or to create these uh, machine learning models that are much more effective overall than if you were to use data alone. So when you say the problem, I'm keen to um, get the definition of the problem. So what is the problem that you're solving? The, the problem can be summed up as bits versus atoms, right? You, you may have heard this analogy coming out of Silicon Valley we, when we say we mostly work with bits, right? Software are bits, you know, zeros and ones. Um, when you deal with a Google ad, right? All of that is just information, information in, information being processed, information out. Whereas when you deal with an industry like manufacturing or automotive, you're dealing with physical things and we, we call it atoms. And inherently atoms move much more slowly than bits, right? Uh, and it turns out, you know, all of the machine learning techniques that people talk about in terms of, you know, today, you know, you see amazing things happening in, in machine learning and AI, right? But that's thanks to sort of the very data-driven world. Uh, machine learning is nothing more than recognizing patterns from data. Uh, when you move to the physical domain, and let's say you talk about a problem where you're trying to predict failure of a component in the vehicle. Uh, in order for the machine learning algorithm to learn that sufficiently well, you need a lot of past failures, right? But by the time you stratify it by the car model, 
you know, the conditions under which it was operated in and, and where it is in the car and so on. It turns out you don't have enough data. You don't have enough failure data to, to train, right? Advertising, you have billions of clicks every hour. In the physical world, things happen much more slowly. So even though it seems like we're swimming in data from all the sensors that we're collecting, that turns out not to be very useful to, to train machine learning model, which requires a lot more, a lot more examples. And so in terms of the solution to that, when you talk to an expert, like an automotive expert, you know, it, they have 30 years of working experience. They, they can look at some traces and they can say, um, I think it's going to be the injection uh, mechanism that, that that's going to fail. And so if you can combine that, you can harness that and automate that and combine it with, uh, with your machine learning system, then you have an overall AI system that's actually, that actually works. Wow, that's, uh, that's incredible. It's, uh, we sort of take it for granted that uh, even though we know that there's been many failures over the journey, but the modern automobiles are a lot more reliable and, uh, and sophisticated. So there aren't those machining failures to then create the data to have an accurate AI purely based on that information. So there still is a need for the, there still is a need from the expertise from the engineers uh, to apply their, their knowledge with your algorithm. So how do you merge the two together? Oh, that's a, that's a great deep technical question. <laughs> um, but I think at a high level, if you imagine uh, there are techniques today where, uh, I don't know when you've seen some of these examples where you can actually type in an English sentence, right? You can say something outlandish like, uh, you know, uh, draw me a picture of a fish riding on a horse, you know, over the moon. And then there's a machine learning model that has learned enough information about images and text. It will actually generate a, a beautiful painting of that. Uh, this is just happening in the last few months, right? Wow. So in other words, we have technology now that, that, that I'm going to use the word loosely, that understands natural language, right? And so we can also apply the same thing but instead of generating a painting, it generates some code, right? And that code is essentially the, the embodiment, the, 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 the codification of that knowledge. You can say uh, if the temperature is increasing and yet the pressure is remaining constant, then you should really take a look at the compressor. And you, we can translate that sentence into code. And that code is then used to train another machine learning model Right. And then the combination is combined in what's called an ensemble. There's a special word for it. And when you ensemble them together, the idea of the ensemble is that it knows, uh, just like we humans know who to listen to for what, right? There are experts in these situations and experts in other situations. So the ensemble knows when to listen more to data and when to listen more to the expert knowledge. So that combination is, is what uh, we, you know, gets deployed in the field. So you, you gather a lot of that info from the experts. You write code around what they, what they, their interpretation or expect, expertise would say, and then if a sensor comes up with some information, it checks with that, checks with the the uh, the AI data, and then switches to draw on that information. Look at this sensor. Is that correct? It's not working. So let's fix that, or let's flag a, an issue around that. Or if it's not, if it's if that expert's incorrect, goes back to the data, looks at what else is happening, checks another input from an, another expert area, and says it could it be if it's not the compressor, it might be the the TX valve. Okay, let's check the TX valve. Right. Okay, yeah, it is the TX valve. That's a problem. So that's how you work work it. That's through. exactly right. Yeah, you understand how it works. You you describe an architecture in machine learning called mixture of experts, right? MOE. Right. Uh, but but that's that's the basic uh, idea. And the cool thing is that every expert, whether it's data or, 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 or human expert, they have their what's called operating regimes. They know they really know things in a certain uh, regime. Right. But outside of that, their advice can fail catastrophically. So it's really the, the combination uh, earlier when you just said, you know, combine you know, listen to this and listen to that. So we actually quantify maybe 80 percent listen to John and 20 percent listen to Mark and combine their, their, their shared wisdom. And that combination is actually better than either one alone. Yeah, it's quite amazing. Now, Christopher, in terms of artificial intelligence and cybersecurity and privacy, how is that impacting the automotive environment? Well, you know, uh, it changes everything, I guess. Um, 
uh, if you, you, you may have heard this phrase you know, repeated many times that cars are becoming computers on wheels, right? As, as it turns out, uh, I don't know what, how old you, I look to you, but I worked on the very first flash uh, memory devices uh, back in the mid 80s at Intel that and the first application for these flash memories, we, we thought, you know, uh, the, the worldwide distribution was going to be 10 million devices a year and it's going to go into automotive application, right? So essentially control fuel injections and so on. Of course, now flash is everywhere. You know, it's on your, your person. <laughs> uh, we, we're manufacturing billions of them uh, a, a, a year. Inside the car, uh, the technology has also evolved. It's been it's become increasingly networked, right? There's something called the CAN bus in the car, and ECUs. These are little processors that are in charge of little, you know, uh, specific components uh, of of the car, and they're talking to each other all the time. Now, when we first engineered these things, right, uh, 20 years ago, we didn't worry a whole lot about security. You know, it's just like it's my processor talking to another processor what else what could go possibly go wrong in terms of you know, of security but now that they are connected suddenly this network is exposed to to hacking right much like our home network or our, our work uh, com, you know computer network uh, is is subject to hacking and if i sit at home and there's it gets hacked maybe i don't get to watch netflix you know for a day uh, but if I'm driving and my car gets hacked, uh, something really bad can happen in terms of, of safety and, 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 and privacy. You may have heard of things like the Spy Car Act in, in the U.S. Uh, Spy Car stands, stands for security and privacy in your car. Uh, so there are different iterations of that that have passed uh, the Senate uh, becoming legislation. Uh, one of the requirements is that by a certain year, it originally was envisioned to be 2023, but I think it's being pushed back that that by that year, all cars on the road must have what's called an IDS, an intrusion detection system. Uh, like who would intrude in the car, right? Other than, than, than the physical guests. Well, it could be a hacker halfway around the world because your car is now connected to the GSM network, it's connected to the Wi-Fi network and Bluetooth and your phone is connected to it. So there are lots, in, in security, we call it the, the, the attack surface, right? The attack surface has expanded dramatically. Uh, uh, so there, there's lots of very good people working on, on this challenge. And I think, you know, governments around the world, like certainly the U.S., they're unlike the, the computer revolution, the, the, the software revolution, where this concerns, you know, human safety and so on. And I, I think government's trying to get ahead of it. And I think that's a good thing. So would it be fair to say, Christopher, that if you get hacked in the vehicle, the safety systems could be potentially compromised by the hacker? Mm -hmm. So they could maybe disable the airbags. Could They could potentially accelerate the vehicle because we don't have accelerator cables anymore. It's all drive-by-wire. This was shown uh, in 2015. There was this well-known incident in the automotive security uh, uh, you know, ecosystem where a, re a reporter kind of challenged you know, some, some so-called white hat hackers. White hat meaning <laughs> that they're out to help rather than to hurt. Uh, and it was, I think it was a Jeep Cherokee. And uh, within a week, they were able to get into his car. And then, you know, one day he was just driving down the road and they were able to essentially take control of the car and, and drive him off the road safely, of course. And so that, that was the watershed moment, right? If, if you drive a Tesla today, uh, and, you know, I, I have a Tesla app and I can, tr can control many functions uh, from, from remote. Of course, that is part of the secure Tesla network. But imagine if somebody could hack into that and and you know changes change various controls. I, I can certainly direct the car to a different uh, destination uh, at the very least. And um, there's other sort of attack patterns as well. We we talk about it. Uh, there was a study of uh, at the um, at Georgia Tech uh, that simulated uh, what would happen if cars in Manhattan were sort of taken over and simply simply immobilized. Right, kind of a mass attack, uh, and and they simulated this, and they found that you only need to attack less than ten percent of the vehicles mm -hmm. in Manhattan to com to completely freeze, uh, you know, all all transportation uh, in in the city. Uh, so these we were beginning to think about these as computer networks and and not just vehicle networks. 
So as far as AI, how does the AI then help with that cybersecurity? In various ways. Um, uh, I was involved in one of these projects, uh, you know, working uh, as part of Panasonic Automotive and, and uh, you know, OEMs uh, around the world. There, there's some well-known relationship between Panasonic and the tier one supplier. And uh, because of, of things like the IDS, the intrusion detection system requirement, you, you can imagine you're just basically this is a computer network protection, right? And there are existing technologies to essentially, you know, for example, there's signatures that you can watch if something gets injected into your network and you can look at that pattern. And you say, okay, that looks like something I've seen before, right? I've, I've seen this particular uh, bug or this, this hack before. Then, then you can trigger something that sort of dis disable the car to so minimize the damage to the to, to, to person and property. Machine learning or AI takes that one step above because the, the very term machine learning means the machine can learn and, and it can learn in real time. If there's a new attack that happens today, right? That was created today and it gets and it gets in the wild right away. Uh, the hope is that with the machine learning, it isn't just following old instructions and miss what's new, but it's kind of like human intelligence, right? Once you've learned something, you can begin to see patterns. And even if it's a new uh, attack vector altogether, that at least you're smart enough to know that it's different, right? This is something I've never seen before. So, so it's safe just to shut the systems down. So that's what AI machine learning contribute uh, to, to, to uh, intrusion detection systems of the future. And can it block that hacker? Is that part of the AI? Can it turn around and say, right, that's not a normal pattern of behavior or, or information coming in. We'll block that and ignore that. Yeah, so that, that belongs to the class of mitigation measures, right? Uh, and, and there are things in the book that are being worked out. Certainly the minimum is, you know, make a decision right there at the vehicle to slow the vehicle down, you know, you know get it off to one side. To, to the, also then defensive measures, you know, shut down the network, block the attacker, but also reach into the cloud and, and inform uh, a, a, a what's called a network operating center, a, a knock, right? And, and by the way, that's a new business model, right? There, there are companies now being formed to essentially run these knocks to monitor network security for vehicles on the road. And so typically when you see these attacks, uh, they don't happen to one or two machines, uh, one or two cars. Uh, they happen to entire fleet. So for example, if you suddenly see, you're looking, you know, we, we have a dashboard, maybe I'll, I'll share that with you. Later, there's a dashboard simulated, right, of, of Manhattan. And then suddenly all the, well, I, I shouldn't name any particular, OEM, some OEMs, vehicles, all of their models go red. And then we say, okay, there, there's, there's this vulnerable, vulnerability there that we should go ahead and proactively protect those other vehicles, even though they're not in motion yet. Uh, so it, it's kind of like an escalation uh, between two sides, right? The defensive and, 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 and offensive side uh, and both sides are getting smarter over time. That's incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. It's incredible. <laughs> now, Christopher, the, you working on a particular type of AI in your company that you're sitting up at the moment called Knowledge First. Can you tell us more about that and how that works in auto cyber? Yeah, so uh, Knowledge First is about leveraging human knowledge, human domain expertise, experience over 20, 30, 40 years to build these, these systems, these smart systems that otherwise would take way too long or, or otherwise impossible to collect data to train, right? Uh, take the example we just, we just talked about in terms of cybersecurity, right? Um, the scenarios that I'm talking about, these cars are not on the road yet, right? <clears throat> They're not being attacked yet. So where do you get the data to train machine learning models? It simply doesn't exist. Or if you have a smart home, you're trying to build a smart home system uh, and you haven't deployed it yet. So how can you collect data? Well, one way, one thing people do is actually they, they would set up these labs, right? And then and you simulate the environment and you train it. But another way that is very effective is simply to, to have the human uh, intelligence anticipate some of these things. Uh, so just now, right, earlier we just talked about what are some of the potential scenarios of these th that these attacks would happen. When we do that, we can, encode, we can encode that in these intelligent systems even before the very first system is deployed. 
And so, so knowledge first, what we do is, is absolutely necessary to build the, the intelligence needed to deploy some of these systems for the first time. Over time, over the period of 10, 20 years, of course, you have enough data to build your machine learning models and so on. But it, when you start, you really need to start with knowledge and then you combine with data over time. Now, I've got, a, I've got a question. So what advice do you have for our listeners to make them more AI prepared? Because I'll be, I, I, I know my limited knowledge of AI, it's, I'm just listening to what you've covered off, Christopher, and I think it's phenomenal. Uh, and it's not down the road. This is here and now, isn't it? This is happening as we speak. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, we'd like to say that the future has already arrived. It's just unevenly distributed, right? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I, I would say that the, the main the, the main division and the main dichotomy I would look at is, is what I have referred to, which is there is what's called the digital economy, right? The 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 the, the bits and so on. And, and here in Silicon Valley, we have been, I think, appropriately, but but also excessively enamored with software, you know, over hardware. Uh, but it turns out, you know, my own personal experience being part of Panasonic. Uh, in, in, in the last five years prior to starting Itomatic is that, you know, we're still human beings. We're still, you know, flesh and blood and we're still atoms. Uh, some of the work that I, that I do is, uh, you know, keeping fish fresh from the ocean all the way to your dining table. Uh, we talk about automotive, we talk about avionics and so on. In that physical world, which is still very, very, it's, it's very much here still. <laughs> uh, maybe this is more an advice to my Silicon Valley friends. You know, we're still physical. We're not entirely cyber yet. In, in the physical world, in order to be effective with AI, you really need human knowledge. That That is the, the biggest, I, I say, both academic as well as, as, as engineering conclusions that I've come to in the last five years is that you can't live uh, you can build these effective systems with just data collection and data labeling alone. You, you really need to leverage the 30, 40 years of experience of that manufacturing that line manager or, or that expert fisherman who can look at an echogram and know instantly that that is a, you know, a school of macro and, and not some you know uh, sand down in the ocean. That is very hard to collect enough physical data uh, to train machine learning models, uh, uh, you know, uh, sufficiently well. And, and by the way, there's also go-to-market considerations, right? If I can get there six months before you with human knowledge, I would absolutely leverage that. So, so I think I think that's the biggest insight that I've learned about AI. I, I guess I have to unlearn a few things to, to learn that. Now, Chris, another question for me is talking about collection of data and, and we collect a huge amount of data already, you know, and we haven't even rolled out a lot of the systems you're talking about at the moment. And do we not get to a stage where we're just overwhelmed with the amount of data we're collecting? And how do we make that beneficial or that we can use that data effectively? Because you're just collecting so much data, how do you just decipher through that? Yeah, I would say on the one hand, it, it is true that there is so much more happening, right? We're inundated with, with data and stimuli. And I think on the other hand, it is it's really a function of, uh, or let's think of it this way. If you, if you look at the human eyes, right? We're taking in enormous amounts of data, very high bandwidth. It's far more data that we take in per day than... Uh, than, than the camera that, that maybe you know uh, that you may be using. So even though the camera bandwidth and the, the, the amount of data is generated may seem very large, it's still orders of magnitude lower than, than actually what happens in the biological world. So that's that's number one. Number two is that we're you know we're building machines that are generating data faster, faster, but they're also capable of processing data faster as well. Uh, so I think you know uh, in in the near term, Right. Uh, it has not exceeded human capacity yet, but, you know, it, it will. Right. In, in many dimensions, you know, machines are already faster, stronger than we are. Um, I, I think the key is that uh, I, I like to use the word augmentation. Right. Machines have always augmented our capabilities. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident they're not here to take over. Right. Even even when they become more intelligent than us, uh, uh, my, my perspective is that they, they become more intelligent than us now, but we will also become more intelligent by augmentation 
you know, with, with, with some of these capabilities, just like the glasses that I'm wearing, you know, I'll have more memory and I'll be smarter. I'll be more aware of what's happening thanks to the machines that are connected to me. So we don't need to fear the Terminator. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm, I'm saying the opposite of the Terminator, right? Terminator, you know, draws a very clear line between, you know, the human race and, and the machines that we build. Uh, but, you know, uh, the, the glasses that you wear, the phone that you use, that's technology that is augmenting you right now, right? There, there is something, you know, uh, surreal when we talk about extending our own brain, our own minds, right? Uh, I think about that, that. That's perhaps because, you know, we're, we're, we're the smartest species on planet Earth. And so the machines can be stronger, faster, but, but if they can become smarter, uh, we say, no, no, that's not okay. Right. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I think we'll, we'll just leverage uh, on top of that. We will become smarter, right? We will become, you know, think about being, being much more aware about what's happening thanks to Google, right? Than, than without Google. I, you know, we, we all used to go to the local library to look up a piece of information. You know, it, that's now instantly available. I think, I think the, the, the march of, of technology. Uh, I, by the way, I, I don't mean to be very naive about this. There are very potentially very dangerous things that can happen uh, if we're not if we're not paying attention. But if we pay attention and 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 we apply it the right way, I think it it will continue to advancement of uh, of humankind. No, I think it's fascinating. And uh, I, I, Christopher, how do, how does someone reach out to you to engage your services? What do they need to do? I think the easiest way is just to go to our website. It's uh, itomatic.com, which is just exactly like automatic, but instead of AU, it's AI, itomatic.com. And, and we have a contact page there and I'll be happy to reach back out. Because I think it's incredible. And thank you for coming on the show today because I'm, I'm just keen to summarize. If I've made some notes here and, uh, and I'm just keen to summarize and correct me if I've missed anything here. But I, I, when I really nailed it down, the, the, the problem is how do you get leverage AI to interface into the real world? And your point of difference is that inter interacting and leveraging human expertise with the machine learning, bits versus atoms. I think that's, that's, that's really, that's exactly that right. stands right out. That's that exactly stands, right. stands right out. But the, there's the scary bit that you talked about how, you know, We've, we developed vehicles, we made them connected so that we could make them easier to uh, update. And it was a good thing from the industry perspective. John and I have been involved in various brands where it's like, great, you know, let's have, have a connected car. It sounds like a great idea. But then there's the downside. Ooh, hang on, these cars, suddenly the CAN bus that was a unique little ecosystem of its own in the vehicle is now open and susceptible to external forces or external intrusion. And it's interesting that SPY uh, Act uh, prevents that so that intrusion detection uh, system, as far as flip flagging when someone's actually hacked into your vehicle and that the vehicle then knows that it's happened and that it obviously brings it to the attention of the driver, but then it's proactive in what it does with that knowledge. So that you, the whole idea is that A, you, your personal information isn't compromised, but B, your safety is not compromised, which is uh, very important because you know, someone can take over your vehicle and drive it around the corner as proven uh, by the white hat hackers uh, with that vehicle back in, uh, in the mid, mid teens. And that's kind of scary that that was uh, <clears throat> so easily done. And I think it was a good wake up call for the industry to engage with people like yourself to say, right, okay, what do we do and how do we uh, improve these systems? Because you raise a very good point. Machine learning needs to have lots of failures to learn from. Now, in in the automotive, you can't afford to have any failures. Right. You, can, you can simulate a crash, a human crash, right? If you if you, you can have a failure with clicking the wrong ad on a on a click online, doesn't hurt you. But if you have a failure in a in a vehicle, someone potentially dies, and that's not good. And you know, it, hum, humanity wouldn't tolerate that. So utilizing your expertise, where you actually harness human techn human knowledge, put those that, that knowledge into the system with, and not just one, but a whole number of experts, and then marry that with AI referencing in and out of those two points gives you a competitive edge because 
if you're competing against another organization that's just using AI alone, their t uh, lead time and go-to-market time is gonna be significantly longer because it takes longer to learn those scenarios. So utilizing your business where you tap into the expertise of the specialists, have that panel of specialists, their information feeding in, working with the machine learning to work out which scenario works best to fix that issue or can report on an issue or change the, the issue uh, means that you've got a competitive advantage over, your, over the, uh, the opposition. So it makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting that the, uh, as far as the NOC, the, uh, the network operating centers that also work for the common good where if there's a situation with a number of vehicles where there's been a, uh, some, an intrusion detection, goes up to the cloud, the cloud then can be proactive and say, right, this is what we're seeing with these particular vehicles. Let's block the other vehicles so that they don't get hacked by that same hack. So there's, there's a lot happening all whilst we're jumping in our car and pushing the start button to drive off and get our cup of coffee. So uh, really, uh, there's, there's, there's many moving parts. You know, security, I'm, I'm convinced, one of my predictions that security will be a differentiating product feature for, for, uh, for, for car companies. That's very interesting for me because I hadn't ever thought of it that way. Because cars are going to get very similar in a, in a, in a way, you know, with electric vehicles and electric uh, engines are basically the same. Batteries are very much the same. So it's starting to become like a commodity. So your defining point is the security and what's coming around out of that. So very interesting. Absolutely. Well, I think, uh, you know, I have to say, I really like your summary. I think it's fascinating. Uh, and I, I really, when, when, when you, the things that you said to me that really stood out, the bits versus atoms, I thought, of course, yeah, because it's the humanity versus the, the, the digits. And then it's the, if I can then, if that's the problem, and then you're bringing the two pieces together, the one that you really nailed me on was I can go to market faster. So that means if my competitor is just living in the AI world or if they're living in the, the atom only world, both of them will be way slower and I can actually be bringing a product into market and differentiate faster than anybody else if I utilize your systems. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because, um, you know, the, the conversation we have with a lot of, uh, of OEMs is that, and, and, and they're very, you know, finally pleased to hear someone say that the, the human assets that you have are very valuable, right? Why, why throw that all away and start from zero with data and compete directly with a Google when you, you have, you know, 250,000, in the case of Panasonic, uh, engineers with 30 years of experience, right? And, and that, that knowledge, that domain, and it, in so many domains, right? Um, uh, it, that is so valuable. All you need to do is leverage that uh, to go to market faster. And the other point that I really liked when you made it, uh, actually speaking with John, was there is so much data. And John and I are data geeks. We, we just love data and we look at what, but it's all about what's, what do you do with the data? The AI narrows it down into what, to assist with the decision-making, which is right. So there's all this data, that's not important. This, this other stuff's not important, but really we see it comes down to this group of, or this sphere of key metrics that we mean we need to do, it tells us we need to do this or the system needs to do that. Uh, and then can, and, and it's real time. And that's the other thing, it's real time. So it, it, it happens super quickly. That's the, that's the essence of pattern recognition, right? Pattern means it's not about the details, right? But this looks like what I've seen before. Uh, and so you take all those stimuli and somehow abstract it or summarize it into a pattern. And then you, you act according to what the pattern you see is. Now, Christopher, if you've got, say, 30,000 engineers, how do you take that information? Do you sit recording the engineers or do you have templates or do you have discussions and questions or interviews? How do you go about that? Because that must be a huge task in itself. Right. Well, we haven't completed that ultimate project, which is, you know, how to extract the entire enterprise knowledge. Uh, up to now, we've been doing one use case at a time, and usually it's a team of 10, 20 people. Right. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, in the case of, for example, Furuno, which is a, a global marine navigation uh, detection company. Uh, you know, they specialize in what's called fish finders. 
and and they deal with uh, you know the experts in this case are are the ex- uh, the fishermen that have been using this equipment for 10 20 years and they're actually better than the engineers right <laughs> because they're, they're the actual users and they say well there's that's a school of of sardines right there and so we we sit down and 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 work with those experts right and they would describe you know, I'll give you some examples. Like you say, you see that shape there that looks like a, a golf ball. You go, well, that you know that golf ball when it's next to that that uh, you know cross-looking thing, it's probably you know some some bubble uh, you know in, in in the net. And so the ability to capture sentences like that, right, or descriptions like that, and then codify into an automated system uh, on on the scale of 10, 20 people at a time. It can make a huge difference in 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 the, in the product line. In, in this example, right uh, before there were maybe for all of Japan, there may be I don't know a thousand expert fishermen who can take advantage of looking at these echograms. But now that we translate these echograms into mackerels and 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 sardines and and so on, and so suddenly the market of of a thousand becomes a million. How big is a threat? of attacks on automotive vehicles. Is that a, a major threat or is it something that will grow over time? I want to say this in the in the most user-friendly way possible. <laughs> uh, if, if, if we look at the, the history or the behavior of our computer network as any guide, attacks on on the car network on the vehicle network and 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 when we say vehicle network these days they're so connected that vehicle network is also connected to you know road infrastructure and so on it is 100 percent guaranteed to happen right i mean we're seeing computer network hacks uh happening uh, every day so so the key is you know uh, maybe i is striking a, an optimistic tone is that uh, there are defenses against these things, right? And and the defenses is not just technology. I mean, we talk a lot about technology dealing with it, uh, but but I think uh, you know uh, legislation, governments are sort of catching up to uh, what used to be wild wild west, you know, cyberspace. I, I think it's good as far as it goes, right? But as an industry matures, and then as we, my perspective is this is sort of Silicon starting Silicon Valley starting to touch physical industries. And when that happens, uh, I, I really think, you know, governments need to be involved, right? And I don't mean in, in any kind of a heavy handed way, uh, but, but making sure that we don't treat, uh, you know, how we protect the car in the same way uh, we protect my laptop, for example, right? So uh, so I'm, I'm very optimistic that, that, you know, there may be some hiccups along the way. That people may do things a little bit out, out of sequence, uh, but you can see uh, legislation and regulation in the EU, in the US, and even China. Um, you know, China is talking about data privacy, believe it or not, right? I, I think um, uh, that combined with with uh, the human element and with technology, I think will will provide us with uh, sufficient defenses. Christopher, thanks very much for making time to speak to us today. We've really enjoyed the discussion. It's pretty fascinating, and I think. Mark and I have both learned a huge amount from you. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you for having me. This has been one of those uh, podcasts where it's been... <laughs> it's like, oh my God, I never thought of that. <laughs> but I always look at the, the upside, which is, wow, I could, that's leveraging your expertise. That go-to-market advantage is huge. But on the flip side, what John was asking just then is like, okay, there's lots of risk here but you're already across what the defensive mechanisms are. So it's not as if that's, that's going to, it's going to happen, but then how do you block it? And there's, there's the, 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 you're already ahead of the game with all of that. So that's fantastic. Absolutely. Thanks, Christopher. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Thanks for listening today. Hopefully you got as much out of the discussion with Christopher as we did. If you liked what you heard, please remember to subscribe below, ring the bell on YouTube, Uh, subscribe to us on Spotify and iTunes. And if you have any questions, reach out to us on our LinkedIn channel at Talking Automotive or visit our website, autocurrents.com. Thanks very much for listening.